Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art. Look what I had. It was on the other side of that paper that I had hanging up. I took it down to move it a little bit and it fell open and this was on the inside. Woohoo! I got actually a really great print from Ackerman. This is what it is. So I'm going to make an effort to figure out how to hang this in the background um, and give it some dignity that it deserves because it's a completely awesome, magnificent piece of work. I can't believe I have this. Check this out. Look at it. It is so... You know when you know a really great, awesome piece of work is when you just can't stop looking at it and thinking about it. That's what this does for me. Anyways, I'm going to continue to read on uh, the book that I've been reading to you nuclear population control through nuclear pollution we're on page 71 fifth chapter lip service to the public health and on that i think i'm going to put this down and just get to reading okay so i'll pick up in the middle of the paragraph where we left off the Information Integration Group expressed its philosophy well in the preface to the many scientific reports on this subject in the following. There are three questions that could be asked about the outcome of the detonation of a nuclear device. It is essential that the reader recognize which of the three, are tr which of the three we are trying to answer and why we feel it to be the most appropriate. The three possible questions are one, what is the worst situation that could develop? Two, what is the most likely situation that will develop? Three, what would be the situation if everything went off perfectly? We choose to answer the first question and to direct our efforts to predicting the worst case. However, in the process of answering the first question, we can generally answer the second. Quite obviously, the answer to the third question has no meaning with respect to public health and safety. We choose to answer the first question because we feel that only the worst case should be compared with prescribed tolerances in a pre-shot radiation safety analysis. Furthermore, only when we know the worst case can we establish an adequate system of post-shot monitoring to document the actual case and to ensure that appropriate countermeasures are instituted when and if needed? In other words, it is only by this approach that uncertainties concerning dosimetry, such as presently existed for iodine-131, can be eliminated. Well, we know from history and from current events that that was never heeded. That advice was never heeded. Furthermore, we are attempting a thorough analysis and are considering each and every radion, radion nuclide on the chart of the nuclides. In this respect, our estimates may indicate that a particular radionuclide is a hazard for one or one of two reasons. Either one, it will be a hazard because of what we know about it, or two, it will be a hazard because of what we don't know about it. If a pertinent relationship is not known for a particular radionuclide, we must make worst case estimates of the relationship and hence maximize our estimates of hazards. Nevertheless, despite its conservative nature, this approach still allows us to eliminate most of the radionuclides from consideration and to indicate those that are potentially the most hazardous. Obviously, it also allows us to estimate the upper limit of the potential burden and dosage. But due to the perversity of nature, the precise dosage can only be determined by post-shot documentation in the affected areas. It is obvious that iodine-131, I'm sorry, it is obvious that had iodine-131 been measured in milk during the early periods of testing, its dosimetry would not now be a problem. Thus, we wish to be able to, through our, thus we wish to be able, through our predictive approach, to indicate what should be measured 
where it should be measured, and with what precision it should be measured. There appears to be no way to ensure unambiguity, unambiguous dosimetry for future events and to assure that the need for countermeasures is recognized in time so that it can be planned for and instituted when and if needed. In parentheses, the reader might be interested in knowing that in 1970, after the current leadership of the biomedical division, Drs. Bernard Shore and Roger Batzel began the reprisal destruction of Tamplin's research efforts. One of the earliest scientific casualties was the preface recorded here, which explains responsible public health exposure. At long last, through the help of Dr. Shore and Dr. Batzel, the preface, so troublesome to the plowshare enthusiasts, could be hidden from further public view. Wow, meaning they took it out. <sighs> Protection of the public from senseless, irresponsible irradiation was regarded as an absolute must by Tamplin and his colleagues. Therefore, recognition of the possibility that radioactivity levels might be higher in some locales other than expected and the readiness to impound contaminated food supplies in such an event were, are the minimal elements of public health responsibility. A reader who asks why do such projects at all is, of course, thinking far ahead of the opportunism that characterize such technology, technologies as atomic energy, then and now, for that matter. New subchapter. It's the unusual cases that are revealing. The Tamplin worst case estimates of radiation dosage that might occur were not drawn from thin air. They were made utilizing actual experience from prior events where radioactivity had been spread around by nuclear tests. To be sure, such experience had not always led to major untoward results, but on numerous occasions it had. For public health purposes, it is such an unusual, it is such unexpected unusual cases that really need to be considered. If everything goes as planners hope, there never would be problems since planners don't plan for trouble. Obviously, however, to protect the public health, excuse me, obviously, however, to protect the health of the public and to, to be prepared for preventive and remedial action, Tamplin's group necessarily had to assume the worst case scenario. What a mockery it would have been not to anticipate the probability of higher than expected radioactive deposition, say from a plowshare experimental nuclear explosion. A rainstorm can predict 10 or more times higher than expected amounts of radioactivity out of a radioactive cloud drifting away from a nuclear detonation. What protection would citizens have if such rainstorms were not anticipated? So I'm going to break here. That is, so that means that this, they're def, definitively saying that the radioactive cloud from Fukushima is in the rain that's right outside my door right now because we have not had a cessation of radioactivity. I think to, this is day 1,130 of radioactivity spewing out of Fukushima. So, I don't know what these guys are thinking that run the nations that have are the decision makers. I have no idea what they, um, I do. Population control through nuclear pollution. I'm sorry, I'll get back to reading. But to the enthusiast for plowshare peaceful nuclear explosives, any suggestion that people might get exposed to excessive amounts of radiation represented a thwart of their technological objectives. Success for the peaceful nuclear explosives program meant being able to explode thousands and thousands of such nuclear bombs to dig many harbors, canals, to move many mountains. If the public became concerned about the prospect of being plastered with radioactive debris, 
There might, reason the plowshare advocates, be a public outcry and a vigorous complaint to congressional representatives and senators. This obviously might cause restrictions upon the program, and such restrictions were to be avoided at all costs, no matter what the consequences to the health of the public. Hmm. So because the Tampa worst case estimates concerned themselves with health protection of the public, his work became steadily more, more regarded by nuclear bomb advocates as an anathema. And the biomedical research at Livermore Lawrence Laboratory came to be regarded by plowshare advocates as the work of the enemy from within. When challenged about his worst case estimates, Tamplin would point to the case to case after case of nuclear explosions in the infamous Nevada tests where radioactive deposition had greatly exceeded expectations. The expectation, of course, having been prepared by nuclear bomb advocates. The bomb advocates always had a ready explanation. Oh, that particular test is atypical. One has to understand this amazing use of an English word. For the plowshare advocates, two phenomena make a nuclear explosion atypical. One, any, any nuclear explosion where lack of foresight and planning leads to sufficient radiation exposure as to arouse public indignation. And two, any nuclear explosion where the public becomes aware that they may be clobbered by radioactivity. <sighs> so that's what atypical means to the nuclear industry. That we find out or that, you know, we get exposed. New subtitle. Oh, goodness, I'm at 12 minutes. I want to pursue this. I'm going to keep going. I, I'm sorry to make this 15 minutes long, but I'm going to do it a little bit. Plowshares atypical results. That's new subtitle. I'll stop after this. There are further insights into plowshare enthusiast views concerning Tamplin's worst case estimates in response to their constant chorus that this particular nuclear explosive was atypical. Tamplin replied, of three recent plowshare excavation experiments, you succeeded in making a crater one time, raising a hill a second time, and creating a volcano the third time. Which one was atypical? Needless to say, Silence was the plowshare answer. Clearly, Tamplin's estimates, when made public, increased the chances that citizens might know what could happen, and this was a thwart, hence the appellation, the enemy from within. It was a depressing but still interesting phenomena to observe as the biomedical research at Livermore unfolded. Tamplin's group reported reports were regularly funneled Oh, check this out. Tamplin's reports were regularly funneled to the director's office at the Lawrence Laboratory, and a new round of haggling ensued every time over the plowshare concern that the reports might lead to public concern or indignation. The work involved in getting a report release got to be nearly as extensive as the work involved in the scientific research and reporting and report writing itself. Slowing down unfavorable reports. Finally, when sanitation of the reports was not easy enough for the laboratory plowshare advocates, a remarkable expedient was devised. All reports pertaining to plowshare must first go to Washington Plowshare, AEC headquarters for, quote, review, unquote, and release. This clever procedure at least delayed possibly unfavorable reports concerning potential hazards of peaceful nuclear explosives. As a as an as a as a harass, as an harassment of responsible biological concern for the public, this procedure present, represented one of the most flagrant violations of the AEC responsibility for public health and welfare imaginable. I'm going to read that again. 
as an harassment of responsible biological concern for the public. This procedure represented one of the most flagrant violations of AEC responsibility for public health and welfare imaginable. As a mockery of AEC concern for public health, a concern ostensibly manifested by its sponsorship of health and safety research, it was cynical in the extreme. Wherever obstruction of such reporting of biomedical concern did not suffice, a separate technique was available, namely ridicule of the biologist's concern for the public health. The old standard cliches were dragged out repeatedly. Everything we have is due to technological progress. Or, do you want to return to the dark ages? They're saying that now. They're still saying these things. Hardly. We are not interested in returning to the dark ages. We didn't regard protecting the public health as a return to the dark ages. We certainly favor technological progress, but progress that serves societal needs, not progress represented by unnecessary, senseless spewing of radioactivity around the earth for all time. One favorite project of the Plowshare Advocates has been the excavation of a new Panama Canal by the use of multi-megaton quantities of nuclear explosives. The biomedical program was charged with the responsibility of considering the potential hazards of such nuclear excavation. Our earliest evaluations of the prospect of such a nuclear excavation were indeed grim for the amount of radioactivity be, to be released in an uncontrolled manner was astronomical. In retrospect, it was difficult to imagine any circumstances under which such excavations could make sense. But we were not quite sophisticated enough to realize this at the time. Instead, <clears throat> we sincerely addressed ourselves to serious calculations of expected radioactivity releases and radiation exposure to humans to be anticipated if such a nuclear explosion digging uh, if such a nuclear explosive digging of a Panama Canal were ever to be carried through. In numerous ways we were informed of the cynicism and contempt held by the plowshare nuclear explosive advocates for the biomedical concern over the radioactivity associated with a major proposal with a with major proposed nuclear explos excavation projects such as the new Panama Canal. I'm really sorry I messed that up. Let me read that last paragraph again. <clears throat> In numerous ways we were informed of the cynicism and contempt held by some plowshare nuclear explosive advocates for the biomedical concern over the radioactivity associated with major proposed nuclear ex excavation projects such as the new Panama Canal. I'm going to stop there. I'm on page 76. We added a new subchapter called On Digging a New Panama Canal with Nuclear Bombs. <coughs> so I'm going to stop there. Um, they really have not changed their tune since 1970. I, I guess when you decide you're just going to kill people, you don't really need to change your tune. Uh, it's, it's, every time I read this book, I get really angry. And I am going to continue to call my congressman and my senator. And, um... I'm going to continue to read the book. Well, you know, I'm with Kevin. We are going to expect that we're going to shut down the nuclear power plants because of this. Thank you, Ackerman. Seriously, this is really awesome. It says everything. And we are not going to let you be the destroyer of life. So... I'll see you guys tomorrow. Take care. Sweet dreams. Put your courage feet on. <laughs> Ciao.